chapter number 15. Uh, we continue our look verse by verse through the book of Acts. Um, I chose to go slow through it because it is a book that's, of high, that's highly important in your understanding of Scripture. The book of Acts, you know what? It's funny because I feel like I'm repeating myself, but Paul says to do that. And I also am aware, you guys, you know, I let you know every, every week that we do have people who this might be their own first and only study of hearing us. We have a lot of people who follow through the Internet uh, ministry, our, our, you know, through our website. And so I have to remind them, some people don't understand the book of Acts and what's its purpose in Scripture. So for their sake and for your, for your, for your sake as well, Paul says, for me to put you in remembrance of these things is for you, it's safe. The book of Acts is the actions and the activities of the apostles. That's what it shows. Whether it's the 12 apostles to the nation of Israel, they are in early Acts. And in Acts, mid-Acts, Acts 9 and on through, you have the salvation and commissioning of the apostle Paul. And what we have here is Acts is written to show God's ministry to the nation of Israel at Pentecost and, and, and after, you know, after the resurrection and ascension. But it also to see the fall of Israel, but also the diminishing of the nation of Israel. Where people go wrong in their study of Scripture is this part. They forget not only that Israel fell, but they also miss the diminishing of Israel. And over the course of about 30 years, we see the diminishing of the nation of Israel, but at the same time, the increase of Paul's ministry. Therefore, you're going to get some things that Paul did that were Jewish because the book of Acts was written to the nation of Israel to show them their fall and diminishing and salvation going to the Gentiles. That's why we're going slow through this book, and we will, because I want you to understand, Paul's going to do some things that are very Jewish in kingdom, water baptism, circumcision, and things like that. Um, but that's not the norm for the dispensation of grace. It was during the transition period, and Paul learned some things. In fact, the book of Acts is written to the Jews. So when he did circumcise and water baptize, those things were signs to Jews about God changing the program because he did those things among the Gentiles. So that's the purpose. Where we left off at Acts chapter number 15, look at verse 32. The elders and apostles in Jerusalem, those men who were part of that Jewish messianic kingdom church, the little flock that God sealed, as Romans 11 says, after the apostle Paul was saved. They're going to get the kingdom. Well, they wanted to find out what God was doing through Paul and Barnabas, and they had the Jerusalem council. So once Peter stands up, he recounts a good while ago that, that Gentile Cornelius and how God sent him to Cornelius. He was confused about it at first, but now he understands it was so that he could stand up for the apostle Paul. It's interesting. In Acts 15, Peter stands up for Paul. In Galatians 2, after the Jerusalem council, Paul stands up against Peter. It's interesting. Peter defends Paul's ministry, but Paul stands and withstands Peter because Peter did some things against the gospel, the grace of God. It's just interesting to see how God is using the apostle Paul and his authority today. Well, that's what's going on. So those men wrote an epistle to the Gentiles who were out there in these Gentile churches because the law of Moses was still being taught in synagogues. It was amongst those Jews who were amongst the Gentiles. In the second session, we're going to see why God, excuse me, we're going to see how Paul uses the Old Testament. Paul quotes the Old Testament a lot. We're going to see why he does that, okay? Just because he quotes the Old Testament doesn't mean he's, he's mixing law and grace. We're going to see the reason he uses the Old Testament in his epistles. But what's going on is these apostles and elders in Israel, the Jewish men, they wrote an epistle to the Gentiles commending Paul's ministry and all those things. And we're going to see that. Look with, look, look with me at Acts 15 and verse 32, where we left off. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. So last week we saw why right division is important. Rightly dividing the word of 2 Timothy 2.15 is important because now with the salvation of Saul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul, there is a new message of, from God in the world. 
Up until Paul's salvation, there was only one message of God in the world, a message to bless the nation of Israel, the physical seed of Abraham. And through them, don't forget this, and through their rise, he would bless the nations. The Abrahamic covenant was the only message in the world from God that through him and his seed shall all the families. He's going to bless Abraham and his seed, but through them, they're going to take the blessing and pour it out amongst the Gentiles. That's going to be in the kingdom. That's not what God is doing today. There's a new message. How that Romans 11, 11, rather through their fall, through Israel's fall. Hold your hand here. Go there. I want you to see this issue of diminishing as well. Hold your hand here. Go to the book of Romans chapter 11. I think sometimes we miss the fact that in the book of Acts, there's a diminishing as well. You cannot go to the book of Acts and build doctrine like denominations do. You get a denominational doctrinal statement, and, and I've gone through them. They go from the book of Acts and, get, and grab all of this stuff, or even to Paul's epistles and grab all the things that were temporary in the book of Acts during the transition. Romans 11, 11. I say then, Paul writes, have they, that's Israel in the context, stumbled that they should fall. They stumbled at the stumbling block, the Lord Jesus Christ. They stumbled at the cross. His ministry, they killed him. God didn't intend for them to do that. He intended them to sacrifice their Messiah like Abraham did Isaac in Genesis 22 in type and to shed his blood as the Lamb of God who died for their sins under the old covenant that they couldn't keep, the Mosaic covenant, and then wait for God to raise them from the dead like Abraham. Abraham in Genesis 22 tells his servants, he says, I and the, boy and the lad will go worship and then we're going to return back to you. Well, God told Abraham to kill him. So Abraham believed, Hebrew says, he received him back from the dead in type. He, he believed the resurrection. So that's what was going on. Well, Israel, instead of sacrifice him, sacrificing him on the altar in the temple with holy hands from the high priest, they used wicked hands, Peter says, and put him even the death of the cross. Well, that's where they stumbled. Christ says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, look at the rest of Romans 11, 11. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. God didn't intend for them to crucify his son. He wanted them to receive and shed his blood by faith. But rather through their fall, they fell. So, the stoning of Stephen is when, when they fell, Acts 7. Salvation has come. Salvation is coming to the who? The Gentiles. That's the, the world. The, 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 the nations. But watch what Paul says in verse 11. For to provoke them to jealousy. Notice that God is so gracious, he didn't just cut the nation of Israel off and cut off every Jew. Although he's not dealing with them as a nation in this dispensation, he is dealing with individual Jewish people, the physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, instead of their Jewishness giving them a relationship with God, they have to come through the cross of Christ just like us Gentiles. They have to be like us Gentiles. And Paul, Paul's ministry in Acts was to provoke Israel to jealousy. Look what he says in verse 12, Romans 11, verse 12. Now, now notice, now, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world. Israel fell and now God's riches at Christ's expense has gone out to the world, the entire world. Now watch this. And the, what, diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. As nation of Israel, they fell, but God gives them a diminishing. They start to decrease in his eyes. It's the richest of the Gentiles. How much more their fullness? Now, Paul then looks. He's, he's telling people that God is not done with the nation of Israel. He's looking forward to the future day when God's people are his people, the nation of Israel. And he says, hey, look here. Even though God is dealing with the Gentiles today through the message of grace, we still live in a cursed creation that God put under the bondage of, of, of subject, subjected to the bondage of corruption, Romans 8, because of Adam's sin. We have to deal with all the sufferings of this present time, even though God's grace message is out there. But watch this. When God blesses the nation of Israel, he gives them the kingdom, and, and then through them, the, the nations are blessed. God is going to take away all sickness, all disease, all famine, all war, all destruction and corruption, it's going to be paradise again. That's what Christ is doing, Isaiah 2, verse 2, for a thousand years. It's the first installment of a, the millennium is the first installment of an everlasting kingdom. Isaiah 2, verse 2, 
It's going to take a thousand years for the word of the Lord to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's going to take another a thousand years for him from the blessing to start out here in Israel. He's going to renew the earth. It's all in Ezekiel and all that. The water's going to flow from the temple. It's going to turn the dead sea, which is all just salt and deadness. It's going to, Ezekiel says it's going to cleanse that sea. It's going to just take care of everything, and it's just going to work its way. The Lord, he, 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 he talked about the kingdom of heaven in a parable. It's like a mustard seed and how it started small and it just starts to fill the whole earth. Well, it's going to start here and his word is going to go out, but also the refreshing, the times of refreshing of the earth. The whole entire earth in that thousand years will get back to how it was back before Adam and Eve fell. It'll be just like the Garden of Eden. OK, the whole earth. Well, that's what Paul is saying. Verse verse 12. How much more of their fullness? When Israel be who they God created them to be as the princes of God in the earth, the earth will be blessed, even more so than it is today. We get salvation full and free, but not only will people be saved into that kingdom, they're going to have a, a blessedness that the world has never seen since Adam. Verse 13, Romans eleven thirteen. 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, now watch this, I magnify mine office if by any means I may provoke to emulation, that's copycat, them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? What we see is Paul's ministry in the book of Acts was to provoke the nation of Israel, not so they can be a nation, but that they, I can save some of them. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says, I, when I'm with like a Jew, go to 1 Corinthians 9. Go over there. We're going to study. The, we're going to start our, our look at the first book of 1 Corinthians next week. And it's a wonderful thing about, oh, I can't wait. 1 Corinthians 1. Now, Brother Dwayne went verse by verse, so we're going to move a little quicker. But there's some wonderful things. 1 Corinthians 1, don't follow man, but follow Paul's apostleship. 1 Corinthians 2, God's wisdom is with the apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 3, you see that Paul is the master builder in the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be judged on it. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul is the issue and how he teaches in every church everywhere. 1 Corinthians 5, now listen to Paul about how you ought to act in your conduct in the church. 1 Corinthians 6, that we're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ judging angels and you all are being carnal by going to law one with another. 1 Corinthians 7, marriage, divorce and remarriage. 1 Corinthians 8, charity working. 1 Corinthians 9, the issue of pain, the, the, the preacher. That's what Paul is dealing with in 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 10, how just like Moses was the head of Israel, and Israel is an example of not to sin, how God feels about sin, you guys need to listen to me and I'll show you. See, he had to keep dealing with them on their carnality. 1 Corinthians 11, the issue of how to have a Lord's Supper, how to come together with food and drink and celebrate the Lord without being carnal about it. 1 Corinthians 12, the issue of spiritual gifts. 12, 13, how gifts are temporal, but love, charity is eternal. 1 Corinthians 14, how prophesying is the major gift, how to speak God's word. 1 Corinthians 15, you got the resurrection, of bodily resurrection. 1 Corinthians 16, how to give in the, in the grace assembly. It's grace giving. All those things we're going to look at. Look what he says over here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number what, which, what chapter I tell you to go to? Nine. Verse, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Now watch how Paul operated, particularly in the Acts period, he wrote this. But this was his gracious mind. Watch this. Verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. That's why when you read Paul is doing things around these Jews, taking vows according to the law, circumcising Timothy in chapter 16, water baptizing these Jews. He's, 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 he's doing it for the Jewish conscience. He's not sacrificing animals. None of those Jews believers were. He wasn't doing those things, but he was keeping the law. Galatians 2, we saw on Thursday night when Peter was over amongst the Gentiles in, in, in Antioch, he lived as, 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 not as a Jew, but as a Gentile. Interesting. Peter did. So, so look what he says here. Verse 20 of, of, of 1 Corinthians 9, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Why? That I might gain the Jews. Paul had a, a ministry in his mind. He's saying, if I want to get these Jews saved, I got to kind of be my Jewish self. He was a Jew. 
but he told him about Christ. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, he died for your sins. Watch this. As under the law, interesting, that I might gain them that are under the law. That's why in the book of Acts, we see Paul doing the works of the law, the outward rituals of the law when he's around Jews. Not to make himself righteous before God. He knew he was righteous in Christ. But to gain the confidence and, and the rapport with his fellow brethren, Jewish people. The only thing he didn't do was sacrifice in that temple. He knew the blood. Of, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. Don't, don't, we're not going to do that. But look what he said here. As under the law that I might gain them that are under law. Verse 21. To them that are without law. Romans 2, Paul says, the Gentiles have not the law. God didn't give the Mosaic law to, to Gentiles. To them that are without law, that's the Gentiles, as without law. Paul, when he operated amongst the Gentiles, he wasn't under that Mosaic ceremonial law. You know, he kept the moral part about it. He, was, he wasn't a sinner of the Gentiles, as he calls them in Galatians 2. But he didn't do all the rites and rituals. When he was with us Gentiles, if Paul was here, he wouldn't tell us any of that stuff to do any of that stuff under the law of Moses. It's not for us. So look what he says in verse 21. To them that are without law, as without law. Now watch how he puts this parentheses, just so you won't think he's lawless. Being not without law to God, but under the law to who? Oh, yeah. Paul says, don't you think I was out there being carnal like these Gentiles? No. I lived a holy, righteous lifestyle. Paul was keeping the law by the law of faith and the law of love, as he says in Romans 13. He wasn't, he wasn't a sinner, but look what he says. That I might gain them that are without law. Now, I like verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. The weak there are the weaker brethren that he talks about in Romans 14. These religious Jews in particular, or in our day, People who, come, who are new to the grace message, who have too much religious bondage in their minds that they're learning to get out of. When I got saved, I, I didn't come from a religious viewpoint of being rules and regulation. It was the, it was the opposite. I knew I, I was a, a lost man who needed the grace of God. But I noticed as a minister, I deal with a lot. Most of the people in the body of Christ are like those Jews who got saved. They have a religious background from a denomination. And so you, you have to minister to them. Paul says, we that are strong are to bear the infirmity of the weak. It's people who, like those Jews, who have religious baggage. They're saved. They're grace believers. They just are learning the freedom we have in Christ. That's what he's saying, verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men. I love that. Paul says, in every situation, God's grace allows me the freedom to do what I have to do within reason, within his will, to save them, to get them saved. Watch this. I am made all things to all men. Why? That I might by all means save some. Paul had the mind of Christ who, had all, who wants all men to be saved and to come into knowledge and truth. And Paul did everything in his power, yea, by the grace of God, to do that, whether it was Jew or Gentile. And we're going to be seeing that as we go through the book of Acts, okay? Go with me back, back to Acts chapter number 15. Go back to Acts 15. So that's what's going on here. So they write the letter to the Gentiles and say, look here, you're not under the law. You're under grace. Uh, Acts chapter 15. Look at verse 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Now, before we look particularly with Judas and Silas, these two men are Jewish, and they're part of the kingdom messianic uh, saints. Remember what I told you. Early in Paul's ministry, he did use some of those members of the little flock who were still on earth and alive. By 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says many of those guys were still alive who saw the Lord's resurrection. That was years after the resurrection, but they were still alive. So what did God do with the believers? I'll give you an example. When, when Christ saved Paul on the road to Damascus, he used a Jewish man named Ananias to go and minister to Paul. Ananias was a member of the kingdom church. He was a Messianic Jew. God, because he, finished, he, he put their program on hold, 
He didn't just leave them idle, just sitting there twiddling their thumbs till God was done through Paul and then the kingdom. He used a lot of these men to help Paul minister. And we're going to see later, he also gave some gifted men who were members of the body of Christ as well. But Judas and Silas are part of the kingdom church. Verse 32, Judas and Silas being prophets, prophets to speak God's word and to to identify the word of God, also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Now, what they confirmed them in was not the Jewish program. Although Judas and Silas were prophets from among that old program, the Messianic Jews. You got, so you got, when, when Paul says, study, 2 Timothy 2.15, we're getting into deep ground here, study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. Now, this is some workman territory we're looking at here, who needed not to be ashamed, rightly divided in the word of truth. God is using kingdom saints early in Paul's ministry to help him minister to the Gentiles. These guys, Judas and Silas, went along with that epistle out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So they got the epistle and then two representatives from the kingdom saints, Judas and Silas, went and and went with the epistle and says, yes, this is an authentic epistle from James and the brethren. We were there with Paul and Barnabas as witnesses, and we're telling you by mouth what is written here. While they were there amongst those Gentiles, They preach God's word to them, but they didn't preach God's word how they would preach it to Jews about Moses and keeping the law. And the Lord Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. Don't do the sacrifice. Don't go to that temple and do sacrifice. Go there to teach Jesus Christ. They taught them the grace message. Now, that's important because that's where you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Hold your hand here. Let me show you what was in the world at that time. Go to Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter five. You know the Sermon on the Mount. 99% of Christians think they need to keep the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's ridiculous if you study it out because you're not keeping the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know anyone who can keep that thing. The people who it was written to, the people of Israel, they couldn't keep it. Christ was putting a, a plateau on them that was steeper than the law of Moses. Watch this. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because Now that Paul and his grace message is in the world, there are two competing words from God in the world. There's the Jewish prophetic program and now this Gentile mystery program, and they're they're in the world together. God has men preaching the grace message given to Paul, and he has men still, still during the transition Preaching the kingdom message, men who don't have a grasp of Paul's message yet. You got to remember that. That's where we had in Acts 15, and right in the, in the middle. Watch this. Matthew chapter 5, nation of Israel. What, must we keep the Ten Commandments? I mean, the commandments. The answer is yes and no. Watch this. Must we keep the commandments? Yes and no. The question is not must we keep the commandments, it's Which commandments? Which commandments? Okay. In the Bible and at this time in history, there were the commandments that God gave the nation of Israel through Moses. Those commandments were then strengthened by the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But then there's some third commandments that are in the world from God. And that's why we have to rightly divide. Let's see this issue of the first and and the second, Moses' law and then the law of Messiah Christ, the kingdom law. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 21. Matthew 5, 21. Start at verse 19. Ah, yeah, 17. Watch Watch the flow. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill. John 8, 39. Ye think, ye search the scriptures looking for eternal life. They are those which testify of me. He says, I'm not coming to destroy the the law and the prophets. All that stuff, not one jot or tittle will be, will, 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 not one jot or tittle will be done away with until all be fulfilled. And that's way out in the kingdom, okay? So Christ says, 
I'm putting you under the law. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, he says. Whatever they bide you to do, do it. Just don't do after their works, for they say and do not. But listen to the law. But watch this. At the same time, because Matthew shows him as the king, he's on that mountain giving his uh, proclamation as king of Israel. Watch what he says. Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no, in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. It's a new covenant in the, in the kingdom. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. Now look at that. He's not trying to change the commandments. In fact, watch what the Lord does in verse 20. For I say unto you, for I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's saying that the scribes and Pharisees are righteous under the law. Interesting. But your righteousness, little flock, has to exceed. When, when the Apostle Paul talks about his righteousness, which is in the law, Philippians 3, he said he was what? Blameless. Isn't that interesting? But when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, showed up, Israel was, the law and the prophets were unto John. Since that time, the kingdom of heaven is preaching. Every man presses into it. They were supposed to move to Messiah because Moses and the prophets spoke of Messiah. And when Messiah comes, his law is going to be even more stringent than the law of Moses. Watch this. Interesting. He says, verse 20, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness. You know, people people say when the Lord says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they say, see, no righteous. No, people were righteous there. People were righteous in the law. Luke chapter one, John the Baptist's parents, uh, the priest named uh, Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. They were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances, blameless. So you can be righteous. Men mix what God does through the Apostle Paul in this unique dispensation of grace where it's no works for righteousness. And they take it and they read it back into back here and you mess up everything. You need to keep, that's what rightly dividing things, what God has separated, let no man join together. That's the importance of right division. Look what he says here. If you don't have righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees and scribes, and they were righteous according to the law, they just didn't believe on the Lord Jesus, who wanted the Lord. You in no case, verse 20, enter the kingdom of heaven. You couldn't even get in. So now you go, well, Lord, who can do that? They're thinking like, we're not as holy and righteous as those religious dudes. We're just the scum of the earth here. How in the world are we going to beat them and get into the kingdom? Now watch. By the way, it's going to be because of Christ. Watch this. Verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Now he's talking about the Mosaic people, the Mosaic preachers from Moses on, Moses of old. You've heard it has been said by them of old time, thou shall not kill. That's one of the Ten Commandments. We learn he means thou shall not murder. The Lord interprets it for us in another passage. And whosoever shall kill or murder shall be in danger of the judgment. Verse 22. But what? I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, now don't miss the next three words, without a what? Call shall be in danger of the judgment. And the reason I'm bringing that up, there's some Bible versions. It's important which Bible you use. There's some Bible versions that take out the without a cause. And the problem with that is later the Lord Jesus Christ himself looks upon those unbelieving Israelites with anger. He condemns his own self with his own mouth. If you take without a cause, in that other passage, it said he was angry with them because of their unbelief. But if you got another version and it takes out the without a cause, you got the Lord himself being condemned by his own words. It matters what version you use. Watch what he says. Verse 22, but whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So what I want you to see is the Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying it's not just the outward murder. He says what leads to that outward murder like Cain who killed his brother Abel was he was angry in his heart. He, what he does is he put them on a high level, not just the action. Watch this. Um, go down to verse number 27. 
Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit what? Adultery. That's part of the Ten Commandments. Watch this. Verse 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his what? His heart. It's interesting. He didn't say you couldn't look at a woman. He said to look on to lust after her. Job, Job 31, he tells, Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes. And why should I think upon a maid? You're going I'm saying this, ladies and men, men are visual. The Lord looked upon women, not in a lustful manner. The woman they brought in the midst of adultery, he saw her. He didn't lust after her. She was a harlot. The fact is, he says, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to think upon a maid. It's that issue of lust. He says, it's not even the action of going through with the adultery. It's you didn't commit it in your heart if you lust after her. That's hard. Because none of us, none of us, male or female, has not at one moment in our, in our life lusted after someone who wasn't our spouse, whether it's before we were married or even after. So what's happening is he's making that law so strong that people say, it's impossible, Lord, it's impossible. Look down with me at verse 33. Start at verse uh, 31. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement, Moses wrote. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery. That was happening all through the nation of Israel. Those Pharisees and those religious leaders would divorce their wives because she didn't make their food right. They had taken God's position of authority as men and pounded the female and find any little thing to divorce their wives and, and to have another wife. And Christ was like, that's not what God meant. He says later, he goes, that's not what God meant from the beginning. He made them two, two shall be one flesh, one woman, one man, one lifetime. That's marriage. One man, one woman, one lifetime. And, and, and in the eyes of God, he hates divorce. He says, if you divorce... You're destroying yourself and her. You're making her commit adultery. It's, it's, it was all messed up in the world. It's, it's like that in our world. Now, when we study 1 Corinthians 7, praise the Lord that under grace, that's why you got to rightly divide, denominations use passages like this to pound people who get divorced and remarried and all that stuff. And I'm going to show you when we get to 1 Corinthians 7 about marriage, remarriage, divorce, all that. God allows that in, in certain cases for peace sake. We're going to see it in 1 Corinthians 7. Okay? Even here, God allowed it in Mosaic times because of the hardness of men's hearts. I mean, God would rather you go ahead and divorce for peace sake, even under the law, than to, they would destroy their wife. You know, destroy her through abuse or addiction or whatever it was. So even under the law, there was some relief, but that wasn't the case. He didn't want that. Okay? We're going to see the difference when Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 7 later. My point is, look at the stringency of the law. Go over to the book of James. The Lord's brother, James, wrote something in the book of James. Go over to James chapter 1. James chapter number 1. I always tell you that the issue in the future, Hebrews through Revelation, where James fits, is still the law. It's that law, both of Moses and then of Messiah. Now, Messiah's law won't be fulfilled completely within the nation of Israel until he gives them the spirit to do it. See, Messiah's law takes the law of Moses, which puts the performance on the person, didn't give them the strength to do it. They didn't have the spirit. All that word did was condemn them. They tried to do it, and it pounded them. It was a schoolmaster, and it was under bondage, a yoke of bondage, Peter calls it, Acts 15, to where when Christ comes back, on that day of atonement, forgives their sins as a nation, the believing remnant. He gives them the spirit, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36. He causes them to keep the commandments in order. That's how they're going to fulfill the royal law. It's the royal law. James chapter number 1, look at verse 25. As James talks to the people of Israel, he says, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty... So that Jew would look at what the Lord said. He's talking about the perfect law of liberty. It's the thing. By, it's interesting that by listening to Messiah through the, Jew, the Jewish apostles in that future day, 
it's going to end up being liberty for them. And it's going to be filled in the kingdom. Watch this. You're going to look at it. Continue in it. Verse 25. He being not a forgetful hearer. That means you got to continue on. Look at the works. They got to continue on to the end. That's performance. But a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So notice, again, when you rightly divide outside of our dispensation in the future, they're going to be back under performance. And they got to keep going. James 2, that's why he ends this chapter 1. He goes into chapter 2, and it's all about faith plus works. Faith without works is dead. Don't you know, vain man? I mean, they got to be working. We don't. Praise the Lord. That's grace. Look at James chapter 2, verse 12. James 2, verse 12. Start at verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in how many points? One point, he is guilty of how much? All. That's why God never, especially in the dispensation of grace, denominations are not, they're insane. If you're trying to perform to please God with your performance and you mess up once like Adam, you're done. You're done. You're guilty of all. God doesn't grade on the curve. He has perfect standard of righteousness that Jesus Christ himself met. He didn't fail once. And that's the standard. Here is Christ's righteousness. You might be more righteous like those Pharisees than somebody else. They might be down here, but nobody's with him. Man. Oh, I better do it like this. He's down here. You can't. God doesn't grade on a scale. You got to be perfect to go to heaven. In this case, to get into the kingdom. Now watch this. Verse number what verse I tell you this to be at? 12? 10? Okay. Verse 11. For he that saith, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Notice those were the same two things that the Lord spoke about over there in Matthew. The, can I tell you something? Those were the major sins of the Pharisees. They committed adultery all the time. Religious hypocrites. When they caught that woman in the midst of adultery, that's because one of them guys was with her at the time, and they had been. They were just doing that for convenience to try to catch the Lord in his words. And that's why he says, you're right, you're right. Moses says, such should be stoned. By the way, did you know Israel didn't have the power to do that? They didn't have the power to do that. Only Rome at that time had the power to, to do that. That's why they took the Lord to make it up stuff so that Caesar, uh, so excuse me, Pontius Pilate could, could condemn them. I was telling somebody uh, at our relative house yesterday, we were talking about how our world is all messed up and they're thinking. I said, I'd sit down with the president and his council, and I'd say, you want to show how a nation runs? Just look at the nation of Israel. They didn't even need prisons. California talking about letting 25,000 their prisoners go to, to uh, ease overcrowding in prison and all that. Psh, you don't even need prisons. Start with the murderers. Just kill, just kill them. Get rid of them. Save your money, save your time, food. So, but you know, that's can't do that. Well, sure you can. Israel didn't need prisons. God made it so, so, so tough that if you just thought about stealing something that wasn't yours, if you got caught with it, you had to pay four times more. And if you stole it and, 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 and repented in your mind and you took it back, you had to pay double. That's why it was a lot of servants, because they had to pay and they couldn't pay. So he, he made it so you might as well just go ahead and get a job and buy your own stuff. God is wise. And I would sit down with the, with the government officials, the president, all them, and just go right through how God did it with Israel. Even if they didn't believe, just the principles, the wisdom back there, our, our country would be even more blessed. But you, they ain't going to never do that. Oh, no. Look what he says here. Those guys caught her, and they, they killed. They didn't necessarily kill with their own hands, but they hated it. And they, and they did, they sent people. By the way, when they sent the Lord Jesus Christ to Pontius Pilate, that wasn't a new thing in their, in their way of dealing with things. They sent other people who they didn't like or went against them. How dare you go against our religious authority, they say. And so they could just convince the, the Romans. Religious and politics worked hand in hand, bedfellows in the Bible, in the world. He says, thou shalt not kill, verse 11. Thou cannot, shalt not commit adultery. Yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the perfect law of what? Liberty. Notice that. That, that kingdom law is called the perfect law of liberty. 
And they were to continue on in that thing until the day of Messiah to come and, 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 and put it in their hearts. Uh, go over to uh, James chapter 5. The perfect law of liberty had to do with love. Uh, the rich young ruler says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, if thou wilt enter into the kingdom, keep the commandments. He said, yeah, I, I've been a witch. He says, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Ten commandments. He says, Lord, I've been doing all those things from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus looked on him and loved him and said, sell all. See, that, that added some stuff. He kept adding to it. Now the kingdom is a commonwealth. But the fact is, he says, if thou shalt love, then the guy says, which one is the greatest of the commandments? And the Lord says, love the Lord thy, let Lord, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, strength, soul, and thy neighbor as thy what? It's love. Israel had missed it, the religious leaders. They thought it was about being religious. And God says the law is about being loving to your neighbor. See, they missed it. Watch what he says here. James chapter 5, verse 20. James chapter 5, verse 20. Let him know, start at verse uh, 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the what? The truth. Well, what's the truth? It's the apostles' doctrine out here in, in particular. What is he supposed to do? Watch this. And one convert him. So another brother comes and says, well, brother, I'm giving you some warning before God, you die in your sins. Like Ezekiel says, you could be righteous, righteous, righteous. You could be unrighteous in iniquity, and you die in those sins. You're dead. So I'm, I, out of my love for you, brother, I'm about to tell you, you, you better stay on with the doctrine. Now watch what happens. Verse 20, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from what? And that's just not physical death. I'm telling you, under that law, like Ezekiel 18 says, you could be righteous, 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 lose your mind and be unrighteous and die in your sins. You went to hell as a Jew. You could be unrighteous, unrighteous, unrighteous. Somebody comes and talks to you and you finally get it and say, oh, snap, I better get right with God offer the, and do the thing. Then he's right. See? Watch what happens. Verse 20. You save his soul from death. It's been cut off. And shall hide a what of sins? Multitude of sins. Hold that thought. Go over to 1 Peter 4. Go right on over to 1 Peter 4. See, in Israel's program, man, even though you're under law, God is patient and gracious. Even under the law. You see it with the kings of Israel, man. They would be sinning, and, 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 and a prophet would come to them, and some of them would say, oh, wow, that's right. We, we, should, we can't be acting like this. Sackcloth and ashes. Lord, sorry. And God says, okay, I'll keep the... Sennacherib, that uh, king of Assyria, off you because you repented. But if you do it again, he, he coming. The kings of Judah, the reason Nebuchadnezzar came is because they didn't heed the word of Jeremiah and those prophets who said, you understand, God is going to let Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians destroy our city and our country and take, take away our power. Y'all are breaking the law. He's like, ah, nothing's going to happen. The prophets in that day, the false prophets of Baal were telling the king, don't listen to this guy. We're the people of God. Nothing's going to happen. And what happened? Nebuchadnezzar came, didn't he? First, first Peter 4, look at verse 8. And above all things have fervent what? Charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the what? Multitude of sins. Isn't that interesting? In Israel's per program, that law that they were following was a law of charity where they had to continue on in these good works, these good works, these good works, these good works, food, clothing, alms, deeds, all these things to be right with God. And they could have multitude of sins, but if they just changed their mind before they died, I mean, I don't know why you would take the chance, but if they did, God will now start to bless them and cover those sins. Interesting. That's not how he deals today, but that's what he did. So when we look at the commands, must we keep the commands? There were commands from Moses to Israel. There were commands of Christ to Israel. Must we keep the commandments? The answer is yes and no. No to these. Yes to another command. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. When you rightly divide the word, these two programs are operating there in the book of Acts. 
There's a program for the Gentiles in the body of Christ. Yea, the Jews and Gentiles in the body. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Must we keep the commandments? Jewish commandments? No. 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet, means you speak God's word, or spiritual, means you know something about the Bible, the spiritual things of Scripture, let him acknowledge. By the way, this is at a time where God had the spiritual gifts of prophets working in prophecy. Paul says, let him acknowledge that the things that Peter writes unto you, huh? That the things that James writes unto you, that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of who? The Lord. There's some commandments that you and I must follow today. They're the commandments of the Lord through our apostle Paul. Go to Romans chapter 6, verse 14. What are those commandments? Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Romans 6. Verse 14, so do we keep the commandments? You bet. Not, not Moses' commandments, not Christ's commandments in prophecy, but the Lord Jesus Christ's commandments through Paul, which is called Romans 6, 14. For sin, you remember keeping those commandments out there for Jews would cover a multitude of their sins. If you want to have, break the power of sin in your life, the last thing you need to do is be trying to be under this performance right here. You can't, you can't keep that. You can't keep the Sermon on the Mount or the Law of Moses in your strength. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, you members of the body. For ye are not under the law, but under what? You keep the grace commands. Romans through Philemon. God's word to you and I today is our instructions. Even when, when there's the temporary instructions there in the beginning of Paul's ministry during the transition, Paul tells you at the end, hey, that stuff is temporal. Now here's the issue, the word of God, rightly divided. As we come down to the end, we got about four minutes, get two passages. Get James chapter 1 again and Ephesians 1. James chapter 1 and Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 and James 1. Why did Paul in 2 Timothy, why we make a big deal about rightly dividing the word of truth? My, my, my wife, Krista, she was in the evangelical free church, grew up in it, her parents and all of them in it. Her mother came over to see us and the baby on Saturday, their parent, her parents. Brought one of her trophies from when she was a little girl from Awana. I didn't know anything about Awana until I met Krista. Approved workmen are not ashamed. She wanted for memorizing. That's what they big in, memorizing verses. Good thing. In the King James, it's interesting, at least back then. And it's interesting to me that they didn't mention anything about 2 Timothy 2.15, the part about rightly dividing the word. Approved workmen need not to be ashamed. Keep going. Rightly dividing the word. So I'm going to put R. D T W. I'm gonna make my own program called R, R D T W. Rightly dividing the word. Awana means nothing if you're not rightly. You're, you're memorizing scripture, but there's scripture over in Psalms and all that, which is good. But then that, that's not God speaking to you. Look here, James chapter one. Look at verse eighteen. Speaking of the Father of His own will begot, begot He us. James one eighteen, with the word of what? Truth. So James, in James 1.1, 1, 1, he says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, he tells Israel, God begot them with the word of truth. Hold that, hold that thought, the word of truth. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 13. Ephesians 1.13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of what? Uh-oh. If you just do a comparison of scripture to scripture, James calls it the word of truth. Paul calls it the word of truth. But Paul qualifies his as the gospel of whose salvation? Your seven, you Gentiles. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy, James talks about a word of truth. Paul talks about the word of truth. And he says to rightly divide the what? The word of truth. 
See, and, and, and go back to Acts 15, and we're going to come down to conclusion. When those apostles were out there preaching, excuse me, when those prophets, Judas and Silas, we'll look more at them next week, they weren't out there preaching to Gentiles the word of truth as James would have pre preached it to them or as it applied to them. They were Jews. When they heard Paul, yea, when God gave them the understanding, because they were still prophets, for, uh, Acts 15, look, go to Acts 15, look with me, if you will, at verse 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren, those are the Gentile brethren, with many words and confirmed them. The many words that they were giving and confirming them, giving them strength, making them firm, was not the words how James would, would teach it and how they were being taught before Paul. God used Judas and Silas, and we'll see more about them next week, to confirm those brethren, those Gentiles, in the word of God's grace. Now, we're going to end this study. I want to say one more thing because I want to get this on the tape. Get two passages, Hebrews 10 and Colossians 2. Why is that important? That we see that God used these Jews to preach Paul's message because it's temporary now. It's temporary. God is not finished with Israel. It's just temporary. Hebrews chapter 10 first. And then we'll, we'll end in, in Colossians 2. Hebrews 10 and Colossians 2. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things, what's those next two words? Yeah. To come. And not the very image of the things can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers there unto purpose. So he is, he, he, is, he is showing the significance of going from the old covenant under Moses to the new covenant under Christ, okay, for Israel. But he said the law has a shadow of thing, good things to come because part of that law, it, all that stuff, it has to do with the kingdom as well. And, and end in Colossians 2. This will, this will tie it up. Colossians 2. The fact that God is not dealing with Israel and mankind under the law today is only temporary. One day he will begin again to deal with Israel and mankind under the law. When I say mankind, Israel's the head and everybody, all the world is going to be guilty before God, Romans 3, Paul said. Look at Colossians 2 and verse number 16. To us grace believers, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things, what? To come, but the body, the fulfillment of it is, in, is of Christ. That's we're in Christ. So Paul is telling us that even though God is not dealing with us Gentiles under the law, so don't you let fools who don't know anything come and try to put you under performance-based acceptance. You're not because the body is of Christ. You're in Christ. It's a shadow of things to come. So when we rightly divide the word and we're going to look, we're going to look at this, Although we're seeing the diminishing of Israel, I don't want anybody to think, because people will, there are people who look at the Jews and they just, they're anti-Semitic and all those things and hate the Jews. That's ridiculous. You love them like you love any lost people. They're lost. They were Christ rejected, but they lost. But God, when he's done with this program, being a Jew in that day, after the rapture, it matters to God. God, what he was doing back here, he will continue on in the future, okay? All right, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your truth, the truth you committed to the Apostle Paul for us today. Father, we, 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 we marvel at your wisdom, how the book of Acts put ties everything together from law to grace, prophecy to mystery. And then we thank you that with the, with the books that you gave to us through the Apostle Paul, you tied together your eternal purpose for the heavenly places and the earth in Christ, the mystery of Christ. But, Father, we also thankful that you're not done with the nation of Israel. 
that you will continue your covenant with their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that you will give the believing remnant of Israel their kingdom. We just rejoice in your faithfulness to all men and of all dispensations. As we take our break, we give you thanks and praise for teaching us your word. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>